Hey, Hound Dogs, I'm David Hankins. And I'm Paul Hankins. And welcome to On the Air with Power Squared, a weekly look behind what we hope will be everyone's favorite comic book, Power Squared. Uh, this week, we're taking a look at G-Man Comics, and we have uh, some guests with us. Uh, Rick Offenberger. Say hi. 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 Uh, thanks. And then Eric uh, Bennett. And... How are you doing, gentlemen? So, hi. All right. Um, hi there. Hey, thanks. Welcome. Thanks for doing the show. Um, we're going to start with Rick because we actually met him <laughs> before at uh, WonderCon. I don't know if you remember a few years ago in Anaheim. Absolutely. Yeah, and you were very, you've been very nice to us as far as uh, actually reviewing our comics and actually uh, uh, occasionally printing our press releases. So we appreciate that. Um, so uh, you're sort of the ringleader of all this as the editor in chief. Well, well, we all got into this together because I was just minding my own business and Eric's the one who said, you got to meet Gilbert. Okay. And um, I, I was just being a fanboy and I was uh, working with an artist and we were just doing some fanboy art and all that. And um, then Eric introduced us to Gilbert and Jim started us uh, publishing some fanzines. And by the time you knew it, we were in the publishing business. And so uh, okay. we're having a little bit of fun and okay. we're producing some comics. We've got two of them out right now uh, that we finished. We're just getting started to launch our next Kickstarter, uh, which will have uh, three more issues and an update on our who's who. So it'll actually be four books. Wow. And uh, we've already got the artist started on Kickstarter number three. Uh, that just started today. And, uh, you know, we're maybe putting the cart before the horse, but it takes a while to get all the art done. Yes. And so we've got artists in various stages finishing the art up for our second Kickstarter um, before, you know, but as soon as someone's ready, they're starting on the third one. So are these all going to be um, your Simon and Kirby agent stories or are there going to be other ones? We've got a variety of stories. Um, I'm, we're doing Simon and Kirby, the agent as uh, an ongoing, well, they're all ongoing, uh, as an ongoing. So we'll have the third issue of that. And then we're doing G-Men three in one where each of the three of us will do one story in, one, in the comic. And so okay. we'll introduce uh, other characters for that. And then as we were working on this, um, I was gonna do a backup story in the uh, Agent Kirby comic, uh, which was gonna be a Hawk and Dove style story. And then I realized that I'd read a lot of those pages for some who's who pages in the comic. So we didn't really have that space and that branched out into a whole new comic that we're doing uh, G-Men United, and we're going to have four stories in that, um, and so Jim's doing one, and I'm doing two, and then we've got another um, story in there that we're, we're throwing in, and um, so now now we're publishing four books in each Kickstarter, because we update the who's who with uh, each version, right. so you get a look ahead of what we've got planned uh, for the next Kickstarter as we introduce some of the characters there, and it gives you some background that we couldn't go into in the page counts that we have for our characters so you get a richer feel for who they are. Um, do you want to tell people who aren't familiar what is the Simon and Kirby agent stories about? Um, well, I always loved patriotic characters like Captain America or The Shield or Fighting American. And so the agent is an FBI agent who's assigned to be a superhero in uh, for the FBI. And in our world, there isn't a civil war. The government just required all superheroes to register, and they did. And so uh, Jim is going to tell the story of what happens when someone doesn't want to go along. Okay. And he's got that story coming up in our G-Men United. And so my, my lead character, Simon N. Kirby, is the um, superhero who runs the whole organization for the FBI. And uh, he's not real excited to be a superhero, but that's what they assigned him to do. And that's what he's doing to the best of his ability. And then um, I have a character called, uh, it's, a, it's a male and female character called Lynx that I actually created 30 years ago. And I had mm -hmm. put them out when I had a comic shop as an ash kid. And so they're coming back. And then <laughs> I've got another character, um, Sergeant Flag. And uh, just as uh, the agent is Simon and Kirby, Sergeant Flag is uh, Rob McFarland. And it's a 90s style super, uh, patriotic character with different motivations and different type of actions. And based on the names, you can see the type of characters they're gonna be. Okay, wow. So uh, 
So both the Jim. White, the fellow in white is Simon and Kirby. The one behind him is my character, and the one behind him, the the red, white, and blue character behind him, is Eric's. So okay. those are the three from three and one. So how did you guys? Did you guys? How did you decide this is your character and that's his character and all that? How did you make that decision? Well, we all had our own characters that we brought into the mix. We'd already done them for years, you know, just as, as, as fun fan projects. So you, uh, okay. And so we brought them in. But the world is Jim's world. We're, we're all playing in Jim's uh, universe because he has a rich and, uh, you know, full world. Okay. Jim, you want to tell us about that? Um. Back in the 80s, when uh, Superworld first came out and, and uh, got George R. R. Martin not writing for a year because he was playing <laughs> games, um, uh, my crew here in, 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 in Massachusetts were playing the same game that George was. And we tubed on that and played it for a couple of years. And about 10 years later, I decided that I wanted to run another superhero role-playing game. But the world we built was rather a mess. And uh, so I started from scratch and just started building up a, a, a new world. And I started with uh, the, these characters behind me here, um, Bet Noir and, and, uh, and her sidekick, um, uh, Belladonna. And pretty soon, a bunch of years had passed. I'd discovered a program called Hero Machine that allowed you to put together pictures of, of superheroes and I had about 200 heroes and 150 villains, and there you were. It was a whole world, and it, it spanned from the 1920s up to today. Um, and so when we decided to pull this together, Rick said, why don't we use your world? And so we're building it in my world. Um, and uh, so, so Now, do all the characters that are in G-Man already exist in your world? Are they are new ones or...? Each of the other two contributed uh, a number of new char of characters that they'd created in the same time frame. So the, I was looking at the, uh, whatever your uh, handbook and there's like 22 characters in there now. So I assume there's gonna be a ton more that come out. The next issue is gonna be like 36 pages. So there'll be like 34 heroes in, in, in that uh, uh, who's who. Wow. Lord okay. knows what we'll do on the fifth or sixth. <laughs> <laughs> growing with all the, the time. With the, go ahead, Eric. I just say it was growing all the time. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. So, well, we try and include the characters that are going to show up in the next Kickstarter. Right. So we yeah. want all the characters that appear in the comic currently and whatever we have already prepared for the next Kickstarter. So people have something to look forward to as well. But we don't want anything in there that isn't going to see publications shortly. So right. that we, you know, it, we have a pantheon of characters, but we don't necessarily want to show them all yet because, uh, you know, you get people excited about them and then the character never comes out and it, you really lose that impact. Right. Makes sense. So uh, are, you, are you only releasing these through Kickstarter? At the now, at, at the moment. Our hope is that we build enough of a of a uh, uh, of a fan base that we can structure our our our, our pricing and our sales, etc., to go through um, other uh, uh, venues. Okay. The the problem we have is that uh, you know at launching through Kickstarter, we're charging ten dollars a comic, and uh, you know we're, we're not getting rich on this thing. We're, we're uh, you know, it, we, we funded in 38 minutes to cover our minimum expenses, but uh, in, in real life, the, the expenses get uh, get higher with the different things that we do and the printing and all that. And so um, we're at a reasonable price for Kickstarter. Everyone else is charging a similar price and we're not charging more for variant covers and we're not charging more for just artists. We're, we're trying to be fair priced and reasonable in our market. But when you move from Kickstarter to the comic shop, the price drops. Yeah. If we wanted to go through diamond, you know, we'd be looking at a five dollar price point instead of a ten dollar price point, and we would only get, uh, you know, forty percent of that price. And, and so that makes it harder with our printing costs. 
Right. Uh, if we put it available through um, Comixology, we, we also feel that we might lose some of our customer base because we're afraid that if it's available all the time, they won't tune in for the next Kickstarter for their chance to get it. Because uh, when we do the Kickstarter, we've got a budget that we got to meet. And so we want to make sure everyone's there for that. That makes sense. Um, so how many more Kickstarters are you, you said you've already got the second and third ones going or planned? The second one will launch as soon as the art is done. Um, we're, uh, I got COVID during the production of the second Kickstarter, oh. and uh, so did one of our so did one of our artists and one of our uh, proofreaders who's doing some coloring for us. Um, also uh, got COVID, and oh. so it gummed up the works a little. Yeah, and I was gonna, so I was going to uh, ask you if COVID had impacted your uh, works. <laughs> I didn't realize yeah. you had gotten it. Um, so yeah, and so made it harder yeah <laughs> i can imagine so you all are working uh i guess jim's in massachusetts did i get that right yeah and where is eric located i'm in uh central pennsylvania okay so how so you guys are i know you guys all write for first comic news is that how you guys met or did you meet before that or uh i met these guys on the uh uh the uh the shield fan page on facebook that's where I, I first connected with these gentlemen. Okay. Yeah, that's where I met Jim too. I, uh, I found the Shield G-Man Club uh, uh, group and added it with a number of other comic groups, but it really stood out because there was this crazy guy running it and he had started a, an actual fan club. And if you sent him a couple of stamps, he would send you pin back badges and, and, and cards like the 1947 uh, Shield G-Man Club, and oh. he did this for free. You know, he he was just doing 200 pins and 200 uh, uh, things, and just giving it away to make other people happy and make himself happy. And I looked at that and said, "Okay, this is a crazy guy and the kind of guy I I like." So I started to really hang out there and contribute a few a few ideas and drawings and s stuff like that, um, because I think somebody who gives things away ought to be encouraged we have a lot of people who are angry today and i'd like to see more people who are happy right well, that's Agreed. nice um so um obviously you've got a ton of characters but where i mean where do you get the inspiration for them uh well i mean for me um my patriotic character, Simon and Kirby, is just the embodiment of all the characters I loved. I really, uh, yeah, the patriotic characters really resonated with me. And I was a real big fan of Captain America. And then in the, uh, and I'd seen the shield, you know, in back issue bins from the old Mighty Comics, but when they launched the Red Circle line and, uh, you know, I, I actually got by the comic. And eventually I got to buy the private strong comics that I had wanted to buy because I'd seen the covers and I'd, I'd seen some things that, uh, you know, before the internet, that was harder to do. Um, and, you know, those characters really resonated with me too. And I wanted to do my own take on the, um, you know, typical patriotic superhero. And um, it, my character there is a uh, silver age or bronze age style uh, patriotic superhero. So then I also have the counterpoint to that. I've got a 1990s style superhero that would, looks like it was done by the people from Image oh. with a million pouches and an asymmetrical costume and, you know, and, and a lot more, uh, you know, machismo. And so I like to play those off of them as if one character is more of a Democrat and one's more of a Republican. <laughs> I give it a different point of view than it is to be patriotic. Okay. And... Um, then the other character, uh, set of characters I brought in were uh, Lynx, and those were characters I had created when I owned a comic shop. And it was just nice to see them actually see print because I didn't succeed at that 30 years ago when I owned the comic shop. Right. So you had a comic shop as well. Oh. Uh, yeah. Eric, Eric, do you have characters that you want to talk about? Well, the, the main character that I'm doing here, uh, his name is the American Eagle. And uh, He's a third generation superhero. I've always been a big fan of legacy. Uh, DC's Justice Society is a, a big favorite of mine. I love Marvel's Invaders. And uh, 
this the idea of family and mantles being passed down through the ages. Uh, I've always been a big fan of Superman himself, so I've always really liked that power set, which is what the American Eagle possesses. He possesses, you know, like the invulnerability, the flight, the strength. Um, but he's a third generation character. His grandfather, the first American Eagle, wasn't anywhere near as powerful as he is. And it's just sort of progressively gotten stronger as it's gone through the generations. What is the source of his power? Um, the current American Eagle, uh, because it's a family trait, he's sort of genetically predisposed okay. to have it, but he did not have any powers when he was born. Uh, he is an air or a, a naval pilot, and he uh, was helped stop a terrorist plot. They shot a missile at New York City, and running out of ammo on his jet, he actually flew his jet into the missile and detonated it. And the radiation from the explosion actually triggered his genes, hmm. and all his powers emerged. Okay. So instead of a radioactive spider, it's a radioactive missile. Okay. No, so, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so what is the, I mean, what is the process? I mean, I know that on these first two issues, Rick is shown as the listed as the writer and uh, one of you is, is the editor and one of you is the consulting editor. How does that process work? Um, I, I do um, mo most of the production. Um, so we gather the artwork, uh, Rick commissions a lot of it, um, uh, driving the artwork and he did the writing for the first two, two uh, comics. Um, I've been uh, putting them together, putting trade dress on the covers, uh, editing it. Um, the, uh, the, the character, uh, where is it? this character, <laughs> the uh, uh, demon priest is the hero of a novel that I'm writing. And uh, I have a, a group of copy editors who help me every week go over what I've written this week. And so I got them into helping copy edit all of the, the, the text and things. So I, I pull it together and then we send it off to um, uh, Kablam, um, who uh, do the uh, uh, print on demand and uh, um, this last time I actually created the PDFs because uh, you can get the PDFs from Kablam, but they're actually the source that, that gets printed. And so it includes all of the untrimmed trim area. So I got finicky and made PDFs that were trimmed so that they match the comics. Um, uh, so I, I, I'm kind of the production department. Uh, Rick has been our main writer and he's also negotiated, um, you know, all this, the contacts with with a lot of the, the artists. Not all of them. Eric's got a number of, uh, of good contacts, and he's brought some 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 really good talent in to help us. Um, uh, and in fact, he introduced the two of us to uh, Gilbert, who was our, our our initial primary artist. So, uh, you know, we 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 all share um, uh, stuff. And and for the. For the newsines for uh, three and one and um, G Man United, we're all writing. So. That's good. Yeah, uh, the goal was for all of us to write uh, and all of us to present our characters together, and so that that was the goal from day one. And it just uh, it's a long process, much yeah. longer than expected. <laughs> uh, we started in February. And our Kickstarter launched in uh, in August and ran till September, and we were supposed to, and we shipped in October. And so I had this idea that we might be able to launch that next Kickstarter pretty quickly, but now we're looking at uh, probably February for the launch of Kickstarter. So how how about how long does it get? Does it take you to go from writing it to having the, the artist do the drawing and the lettering and all that? How long does that take? Well, it, it all depends. Um, with the uh, first issue, I tried to do Marvel style. And because I talked to Gilbert, it was the first thing I had written uh, as a comic. And um, I'd done a lot of writing that was journalistic writing, but I'd never done a comic before. And he had more know-how than I did. So I wrote it Marvel style. And then after that, uh, I went to full script, um, feeling more comfortable with the process. But uh, 
typically I'll write the, um, my script and then um, I'll end up sending uh, my script off to uh, Lou Mugen, who is our, our script editor. And uh, he'll take a look at it and uh, make sure it makes sense and make sure I haven't, uh, you know, I, I am too much of a fanboy. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm, I'm watching uh, TV and I have this character for the second issue uh, who we ended up calling Murder Hornet. Uh -huh. But originally I called him the protector and he was dressed in all white and his, uh, he had a, a headdress that was kind of pointy at the top. And um, that, that was the direction I was going at, which was a little heavy handed. And he, his origin was a lot more like Batman and um, my wife and I are watching TV and they talk about the murder hornets invading uh, and how they're killing the honeybees. And as soon as I saw that, we had to change it to murder hornet. Yeah, I was asking, I was, so, that was one of the characters I was, I was curious. Uh, it seems like it's ripped out of the headline, so to speak. Yeah, as soon as I saw that, I thought that's, that's great. We got to do that. And, uh, but uh, Lou stopped me from uh, borrowing too heavily from um, Batman. I, <laughs> I really like the echo of the idea that uh, Alfred was a Nazi. <laughs> and uh oh, yeah. he raised uh batman to be a nazi right and you always when you have a patriotic character the nazis were always the best villains so i thought this would be fine right but um you know i i uh overreached in, in my story and, and so i was told uh you know may, maybe we want to tone this down a little <laughs> and, and so it's nice to get other perspective and so, you know, that's part of the process. And we all go back and forth and read each other's scripts and, and uh, you know, give feedback. And uh, Eric sits there as he, he, Eric does all of our lettering. Yeah. And so he's the last one who, who really sees it before it's, it looks like a comic to us. <laughs> and um, Eric will say, no, 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 we can't do this. Or no, there are too many words here. Or the script doesn't look quite right like this. And then we'll make revisions at that, that end too. Right. I threatened today and, and without to, Eric. I'm sorry. I, I threatened today to to make him go back and change the credits on the first page to say additional dialogue from Eric uh, and, and Bennett because he and I were were going over uh, pages in my story and he had such good ideas on how to change it and stuff. So I was about ready to tell him that he had to have writer credit on it. Uh, there's <laughs> we, a lot of give and take here yeah the letter the letterer is the last line of you know this is the wording makes sense kind of stuff um yeah after uh, after eric it goes to our proofreaders and there's a whole army of proofreaders who will read this i think we're up to we're up to five now yeah and thank goodness for that <laughs> yeah <laughs> they catch mistakes they do exactly i'm oh. so happy it i want the books when we're all done to look as professional as possible and something as simple as a, you know, a simple misspelling or something like that. I mean, that just kills, kills it. You know, so yeah. the, the more we can catch that, the better. Yeah. We understand that. Yeah. Um, so you have like uh, on your website, you list like 18 people or the working on your comics. Is that correct? Yes, yes, yeah. because um, it's the three of us doing the, the majority of the writing. I would have said it was the three of us doing all the writing, but we ended up with a story written by Earl, so uh, who's one of our copy editors. So who, who knows what we're doing in the future, but that was the plan was the three of us would do the writing. And then we have five of those people there as copy editors uh, who, who read through it and make sure that we don't have any spelling mistakes. And then uh, everyone else on the list uh, is doing art. Wow, and we got uh, we got five different artists working for us right now, it, or six. I think so. Really yeah. talented guys. And are, are they all yeah. working on separate issues? Or are they working together, or how does that work? Well, some people only do covers, and some people are doing interior stories. Uh, we started with Gilbert doing the first issue of everything, uh, or at least the first issue of uh, Agent Kirby. And then he moved on to do the first issue of the three and one for us, which is, uh, you know, the art is all done on that. So now we're, we're in the lettering stages of the last pages there. Four pages and to then, go. How many? <laughs> Four pages to go. Four pages to go. And then we've got that one to bed. Um, Alan is uh, started with issue two on uh, Agent Kirby and he's doing issue three uh, right now. 
Um, and he's more than halfway done with that. Um, and then uh, Josh is uh, doing three of the stories um, in, in our um, G-Man United and Fish Lee is doing the other story and Fish Lee finished his story and that's complete lettered and, and all out the door. Uh, the other ones we're still working on. Uh, Josh has a, a different styles that he does where he does a, a very cartoony um, style and uh, a very straightforward superhero style. So I wanted to do a story where we actually did that transition with the character. So we went into um, part of uh, Jim's world to travel between dimensions. And so in different spaces in the story, the characters all look different. Okay. Utilizing, you know, Josh's talents there. Uh, Stephen Butler has done covers for us on every issue um, that we've done so far as a cover artist. And um, I don't know, am I missing anyone yet? <laughs> well, uh, uh, yeah. uh, Ellis. David, David Ellis Leary is doing the cover on uh, G-Men United for us. He uh, is co-writing that story, the uh, Terra Noir story with me, and he's uh, going to be doing the interior art on the next Terra Noir story that uh, we're doing on the third Kickstarter. So he's uh, just preliminary starting that today uh, for our third Kickstarter. Um, Fishley doing the, the first Terra Noir story. Yes, Fishley, yeah, and Fishley has completed that, it, it, and it's right. beautiful. Right. And, and so we're He's really so happy. Good. He's so good. With uh, G-Men United, um, we have a variety of different artists um, and, and different styles and different style writing and different stories. And so that's been a lot of fun for us. Uh, every character in our universe is potentially a member of the G-Men. And also in our Kickstarter, we let uh, five of the fans have their characters join. Wow. So we had five fan characters uh, join the G-Men for the first Kickstarter, and they're in our who's who, and they were um, they made cameo appearances in the comic. We're going to have five different characters uh, in the second Kickstarter, and uh, part of the reason Alan isn't done, completely done with his art is there are spaces where we have to fit their characters in, and we don't know who their characters are until we start the Kickstarter and they pledge. And okay. then uh, they'll be in our who's who as well. Now, now, does I assume that somebody pays you extra to have their character included? Is that part of the deal? That that is that is correct. Okay. So, you, um, are you for, a little... for the first round? Go ahead. Uh, for the first round, we charge one hundred dollars to have your character join um, the the G Man, and your character was featured inside the G Man comic. You got a who's who page that Gilbert did, and that's in the handbook. And then we also we also produce trading cards. Mm -hmm. And so there was a trading card of your character, too. Wow. And so um, you got your character. I mean, I'd always wanted to produce my character. It was sitting on the shelf for 30 years. And this is an opportunity for uh, someone to have their character join. And, and I mean, we're paying the artists to do the art. We're, right. you know, I mean, we're doing the production on this. And so we figure it's a fairly decent deal. And those snapped up pretty quickly. So we thought everyone was happy. Um, is there any, I'll just ask this because, you know, we have never talked. We haven't talked about it, but we do a comic book ourselves, which you know. Uh, do you have any issues with a fan created character appearing in your? You know, do you have any copyright issues? Do they sign away that, or did that not come up, or what? They uh, they agree to allow us to use their character in the one story that we've uh, we've agreed to use, and they um, agree to let us use it in that particular who's who that we published. And in that uh, set of trading cards, but uh, we don't have any ownership of their character. It is just a guest appearance. Right. So they own all the copyrights and trademarks to their character, and we won't wouldn't be using it going forward without them. You know what I mean? It's right. not yeah. our character. Right. No, I was just but curious the way we've written our universe, there's a superhero registration act, so everyone can be drawn into the G-Men because that's <laughs> how they get to operate as a vigilante. And so these are the ones who are used for that mission. So kind of um, like Mission Impossible with Peter Graves. <laughs> or at least the FBI thinks everybody who's registered gets to be drafted. Um, one of our stories is actually about a hero who doesn't believe this. Uh, so. Um, so who is the ideal reader for your comic books? Well, we'd like to think it's everyone. 
Yes, but uh, <laughs> in reality, it's probably it's probably us. Uh, it, it's probably a fan of uh, Bronze Age comics uh, who uh, may be a little disenfranchised with the current, uh, you know, soap opera storytelling that you need to buy ninety-two issues to tell a story. Because we tell, uh, you know, because of the nature of Kickstarters, we tell it in one issue or we tell multiple stories in one issue. And so um, that's who I see. What do you, what do you see, Eric? I see uh, just people that like good old fashioned fun comic books, you know, that's what I try to write. You know, basically a comic I would enjoy from when I was younger, nothing too heavy, nothing too, too uh, overwhelming, just, just good almost done in one style comic book stuff. Yeah, I mean, I started uh, in the early Silver Age reading comics and, and, and was involved in, uh, um, you know, in, the, in the fan community back then. So um, I think of myself as the kind of target. And that means I think of myself when I was 12 years old as a target. And I think of myself as I approach 70 as, as the target. I was at the AT&T phone store today buying a new phone. And uh, the guy who was upgrading my, my old phone saw um, five of my characters um, as my lock screen. And he, he asked me about it. And I started to tell him and he is now enthusiastically watching our uh, Kickstarter to, to open. And he's just a young guy. So, um, you know, I think I, it's, it's anybody who would enjoy the comics the way they were being written um, back in the, in the 60s and 70s and maybe early 80s, where there's, uh, we have an anthology book with, with four or five or eight page stories. Um, uh, um, things are complete. Um, Nazis end up being the bad guys. Um, you know, so it's it's pretty traditional. <laughs> so besides, I'm an 80s kid, so I try to shoot for that general feel. So besides uh, people at the phone store, uh, how are you marketing to your ideal reader? No, no, that we're doing it entirely in phone stores. I'm going to the mobile <laughs> person tomorrow. by person. Yeah, that's that is. Yeah, a, one at a time. Yeah, I'll give you that. Uh, no, um, well, Darren um, works for PBS, and he did our video, and uh, we put out a video on YouTube, uh, you know, for the launch, and we used that video in our Kickstarter, and uh, but most of our marketing was on Facebook. Uh, we, we did very little that wasn't on Facebook. Um, we sent out press releases and we got a little bit of coverage. And we uh, did some podcasts and we did some interviews. And so there were, there were a few things that we did, but uh, by and large, most of it was uh, all on Facebook as we engaged our readers there. Um, the Shield G-Man Club is where we all met. And that's where we have people that were deal with regularly, but there are a lot of independent comic uh, Facebook groups. And so we, we put them there and then I put them on my personal page. And so people who knew me were excited that I was doing something and uh, joined in just to see, you know, if I did anything any good or if I fell on my face, I would imagine. I put up a poster at our local comic book store. You know, we, this, is, this started as a, a, a very fanish effort. So it's been small scale, but. Yeah, I took after it was printed. I took books to my comic book store, and we put them on the shelf with the new comics, and uh, had them up for sale for two weeks. Did you sell? Yeah, well, that's good. Not, not not enough to pay the bills, but no. you know that wasn't the point. I mean, how many indie comics do you sell in, in the shop? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I think I brought in five of each, uh, ten comics, and I think I left with uh, two of each, and you know, so. Someone enjoyed it, but you know, it wasn't it wasn't a, a huge marketing success that way. But if you're doing diamonds, you know, you're hoping everyone orders three. Yeah. Yeah, we um we we had gone up to our local comic book store and he was like not interested in helping independent comics get going. So uh I won't go into the our whole little history with that. Um so uh I noticed you have a fanzine uh page on your website. When I looked last night, it was blank. I mean, is, there, is that something that gets filled in occasionally or is that something to come or what? 
No, no, we we did a fanzine, but the fanzine was um, for for the Facebook group. It wasn't actually for our characters. Okay. Um, but um, that we had a lot of people contribute, and so that was our first publishing foray, really. Um, is we did the fanzine together, and it was free. It was it was a free download. It still is free, but it was, it's a free download. And if you want a print copy, because some people did, but most people are happy with the free one. Uh, it was printed by Kablam, and whatever Kablam charged for printing that thing was the price. And there was right. no profits made or money paid to anyone who worked on it. And everyone, you know, who was a member of the Facebook group, you know, who wanted to contribute did. There was no, you know, there was no real, we added stuff, but we didn't say, oh, no, we won't take your stuff. And we wanted stuff that, you know, at all different levels, because we had people who were professional writers and people who weren't. And, oh, there you go. Jim's got one right there. So it. That's an issue. Okay. Uh, yeah. And so that was just um, just for fun. Uh, and it really is just a collection of uh, stuff from fans, by fans, for fans, for free. And uh, it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't us thinking we're going into the publishing business. And so, um, you know, that that's just us having fun, which is what we really kind of try and do here. Right. I'll, if you I'll don't just, make money, you might as well have fun. Right. Yeah. So I, I take it no one's making money off, the, no one's living off the comic book yet. Well, so far the artists are getting paid. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. The, I always say I was the only one that hasn't made but, money but, off But the three, of us, the three of us are, are still waiting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, it is a goal. <laughs> uh, I Trust me, I, I understand that part of it. I, I, I yeah. always say that everybody everybody's made money except me on it. So yeah, I understand that. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we think that eventually we, we have high hopes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but but the goal, the goal when you when you launch the thing is to cover the artists. Yeah. Um, well, trust me, they're they're, they're every base paid up. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, so what do you, is the ultimate? Do you see be, do you see this going beyond comic books or do you just, you're just going to stay in that realm? Do you see, I mean, you know, like Marvel's got the movies and all that. Do you see a TV show or a well, movie? We're, or? We're, well, all future? that would be wonderful if it happens, but I don't think any of us have the expertise to to pull that off. So we really need to have, inspire someone else. We did have someone contact us about um, using the characters in a uh, in a game, and, uh, cool. a physical uh, you know game, and he would make physical little statues of our characters. And so we we talked about that. And we we've uh, you know that, that's on that those talks are ongoing. We haven't finalized anything. Uh, we did make T-shirts. All of us have a uh, G-Man Comics T-shirt. Yes. And so we produce T-shirts and we produce posters and uh, trading cards. So we're doing the ancillary things that we can do, but um, we really didn't want to do anything that wasn't printed at oh the T-shirts weren't, but any of the physical stuff that it wasn't printed at Kablam. Right, because we were hoping Kablam would do our fulfillment for us. Yeah, they and they and they, and they, they will. Yeah, yeah. I, I've had that experience with them. Um, um, we got the T-shirts for twenty from um, uh, one hour T-shirts in um, in Chicago, huh. and um, yeah, they do pro wrestling tees, which was my in. Um, I had um, worked with the NWA people um, in uh, California here. And so I contacted them and they produced the t-shirts for us and they did fulfillment on the t-shirts. Okay. That's, that's the tricky part about Kickstarter. Doing, Excuse me? Before we started doing the comic books, um, I was writing a novel and I have this novel, The, uh, the Demon Priest. And you'll notice that, that he's over my shoulder here. Yes. And he ends up in our comics. So I'm hoping that if, you know, people are reading the comics and seeing um, Red Halo and 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 uh, the Demon Priest, who are characters in my novel, maybe they'll be interested in my novel, which I'm about ready to publish. So, you know, yeah, that's cross promotion. You got to do that. <laughs> we, um, we also have the Demon Priest comic. It's an Ashcan comic, but uh, it's not just the novel. Huh. <laughs> right. And do you, I, I noticed there's a little cross promotion with uh, First Comic News. You've got two of your characters. Well, that's because I'm. An, uh, what? Yeah, that, that's because we're connected with. Uh, I mean, 
all, uh, Jim and Eric have both uh, worked with me at First Comics News too. Yeah. So um, before there was a comic, we were on the masthead. Oh, okay. Because they were just my fan characters. I see. And, uh, you know, Newsarama used to have, well, I used to work at Newsarama and they had their own little superhero with the little logo on his chest. Right. And so I had my little indie characters and, uh, you know, they, they were on the masthead before we, long before we ever thought of publishing this. And, um, and, and my uh, Simon and Kirby character uh, was differently colored. But then when we started, uh, when we announced the Kickstarter, people started confusing it with other people's characters. And <laughs> so we had to change. And so uh, my character was all red, but the character they was confused with was both red and blue. And we had some people, you know, ask, oh, are they connected? Are you, you know, and so when our choices are red, white, and blue, and the other characters both red and blue, we went with white. <laughs> Try and stop that. And that, that effectively stopped any confusion and any more questions. Okay. Last thing we wanted to do was run a Kickstarter and at the end of it have everyone pissed off and say we baited and switched and they thought they were getting something they weren't. <laughs> right. No, yeah. No. Um, okay. So, how would uh, people find, your, find out about your books? Well, we've got the Facebook page. And if you go to our Facebook page and subscribe, uh, you'll get updates there. We've got the website, which we update frequently. Um, we just added uh, two more characters this morning to the, to the uh, website, but we don't have color art yet. We only had black and white art. So once we get the color art back from Gilbert, um, we'll update the art and then we'll put something on Facebook too. So uh, the website is g-man-comics.com. And you can go there on all of our social medias there too. You can see the Facebook and the Twitter and, uh, you know, and you can follow us there. Um, if you sub if you were a backer on the first Kickstarter, as soon as we're ready to launch the second Kickstarter, you'll get a notification. And uh, you can also contact us there and we can also add you to the list of people who will be notified when we launch the Kickstarter. But uh, you know, sales of the comics are strictly through Kickstarter at this point, uh, because when we, even people who want the first two issues don't have them, we'd like to capture that for the success of our second Kickstarter. Our first Kickstarter funded uh, with our minimum goal in 38 minutes. Wow! That's and so good. we're hoping we're ho we're hoping to beat that this time. Wow! Well, good for you. And some of the artwork that we use in the uh, Who's Who. In fact, a lot of the artwork that we use in the Who's Who um, was originally created. Um, uh, on a, uh, another Facebook page uh, called The Arena run by uh, Gilbert Monsanto, who did a lot of our art. Um, and he's got this really good uh, promotional scheme for himself as an artist. You, um, you, you give him a description or a picture of your indie character, he, and commission him to do a, um, artwork. And then he, when he has 10 of the same kind, he runs a contest and the people who are members vote on which one is best and the one that's best gets another drawing. And so this attracts a huge amount of low, co uh, low cost um, uh, uh, commission art, which gets him a fair amount of attention because there are indie uh, comics that pay him to, um, to put their character in this contest so that it'll get, they'll get a little PR mm. and they get used to hiring him. So they hire him to do other stuff um, he can only do this because he lives uh, um, in, in the Philippines and, the, and his, his costs are low. Um, but it's a, it's a good promotional scheme that makes a lot of users, ha a lot of uh, creators happy. It gets him uh, work. And so we were, we were having these characters uh, uh, drawn up um, uh, through that. And so He's got a pretty good fan base in the arena group. Um, and we're routinely running our characters, um, many of whom win <laughs> um, <laughs> well, that's good. In, uh, in, in the contest. So people are used to seeing our characters. So we, we're doing a lot of things like that, um, given that we're currently low volume and, and, and the like, um, that's sufficient at the moment. <laughs> right. Eric, how did you find uh, Gilbert? Because you're the one who connected us all with Gilbert in the arena. 
Um, I actually think I just uh, stumbled across the arena uh, one day while I was looking, and I really liked uh, seeing him do that, and you can't beat his price for art. And I thought, all right, let's throw Steel Wolf in there, see how he does, and then just started doing more and more and more and more and more. And uh, it's just been it's a really great group to get to know a whole bunch of independent creators, come across characters that you would have never noticed otherwise that are really good um, publicity for each other. We all start to network with one another and uh, a lot of stuff sort of erupts out of it, like like our own group here. Uh, So it was just a real nice launching pad that I was fortunate to stumble across. Yeah. That's Arena. Is that a Facebook group? Yeah, uh, I believe it's the Arena Two by Gilbert Monsanto. So if you look that up, I think you'll you have to request membership because oh, you got to be a member to post this stuff. Yeah. All right, we're gonna sort of wrap it up here. Um, we uh, thank you guys very much for being on the show, uh, and we may have you back at some point in the future. Maybe when, when your Kickstarter gets going. Um, so we we'll do, we'll do a little closing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so our uh, YouTube outro here. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube and you uh, like this, uh, leave a like, subscribe if you want to see more, and ring the notification bell if you want to see exactly when these videos go up. So until next time, I'm David Hankins. I'm Paul Hankins. And you've been on the air with Power Square. <laughs>